This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Sunday, October 28th, 2012, and I'm interviewing Clancy Gray as part of the Oklahoma Native Artists Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at Clancy's home in Broken Arrow. Clancy, you're known for your jewelry, but you're also a painter and sculptor who's won numerous awards in all media. You're an art teacher at East Central High School, and you've poured your passion into that job as well. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Muskogee, but I don't remember any of that. I remember growing up in Bartlesville, in the south end of town, and uh, that's uh, basically where I gr grew up and just loved to hunt and fish and, you know, Kind of outside of town or in town? It was right there at the 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 end. Our our house was a dead end. So on one side it was the houses, on the other side it was just open fields, Sand Creek, Caney River, Circle Mountain. So wonderful growing up place. What what did your folks do for a living? My mom was a, a homemaker, but uh, later on she became a chiropractor's assistant. My dad was a police officer, and then he uh, moved to uh, uh, Phillips Research Lab and worked in the plastics division out uh, west of town of Bartlesville. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have two brothers, one sister, and all, all of them have uh, some artistic ability. Uh, probably my youngest brother, uh, is known for his work all over the world, really. Uh, and uh, my older brother was a real silver, really talented silversmith. And then my uh, sister uh, did a lot of watercolor and pottery. What was your relationship with your grandparents on either side? Well, on my dad's side, I didn't know them. They were they uh, passed away before my dad was even grown up. Uh, his mom died when he was born and uh, his, I mean his mother died when he was born and uh, his dad died when he was about seven. Now on my mom's side uh, they had uh, uh, lived in Coweta, Oklahoma and they owned a small ranch out there. It used to be one of the largest ranches. I always remember my grandparents and their their home and I love going down there. What did you like about it? Uh, usually, uh, well, I, I like working outdoors, you know, and helping my grandfather, uh, you know, hay and feed and working with the livestock, but I also love to hunt and fish. So they had plenty of places for me to go, and, and I just called it play. <laughs> and um, you have some other extended family members who are artists too, correct? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, probably my sons, both my sons are very artistic. And uh, uh, my uh, middle son, Brad, is teaching school with me at East Central. And our kids are real competitive and, <laughs> and they do well all over the state. And, and then my younger son is teaching in uh, Broken Arrow at Mid High and also coaching. Uh, cross country and soccer. He's also in the military, and uh, so that keeps him pretty occupied as well. What is your first memory of seeing Native art? Probably, I would say, I, I, I knew it was there a long time ago, but I didn't really, really even get started into art until probably, I don't know how many years ago, but anyway, I took a sculpture class under Norma Miller, changed majors. All I lacked was my student teaching and about five hours to get my degree in physical education and changed majors. So then I took two more years of art, just nothing but art classes. <laughs> and I really didn't start getting in, in, that interested in, in the Native American art until I started going to some powwows with my dad. And uh, we'd set up 
of our little displays and stuff like that. And that's basically how I got going. Wait, was your dad putting some work in as well? Mm -hmm. I taught him how to do silversmithing. Mm -hmm. um, well, what is your first memory of doing any kind of art? It was in, really in college. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, well, I just thought I was going to be playing baseball forever, but <laughs> and I, that, you know, that notion went out the window, and then I found a real love for it, and a real passion for it, and I have a real passion for teaching art. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's basically... So, no, you didn't do any sketching when you were young? Mm, well, you so. know, just n nothing... I was too busy being outside, you know, so the art part of it didn't really hit me until... I was in college. Were there any art teachers at the elementary school level or high school level that ever made an impact on you, or did you take any art classes that you? Remember? Well, I took I took some art classes in high school. I took some uh, private lessons. I can't even remember his name. Jack Grace. You know, when I was real little. Private lessons and in in uh, art. You know when I was growing up, but r really, the my most influential teachers came from uh, Central Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they're the ones that kind of opened the doors. There's, uh, I could name them all. What kind of a, a background did you get? That just, um, well, first of all, I guess. Let's go back to that decision. You're almost ready to graduate, basically, and then you decide you're going to take, you're going to do your student teaching, but then you decide you're going to take two more years of art. Do you remember the f things you were thinking when you made that decision? Uh, no, I just I wasn't married. I wasn't playing baseball anymore, and so I just like, well, why not? Probably the best best idea I had, because I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed all of the art. Did you get fundamentals in each of the media that you currently work in, or what What kind of base pretty, did you get? Pretty much, I, uh, uh, you know, we have so many different art teachers at Central State that, you know, I, I learned from them to take all the knowledge I could from all of them, and whether I use it or not ever again, you have that knowledge. And that's basically the same thing I tell my kids. Like, you know, my kids at East Central, they'll go, well, you know, we want to stay in here. And I say, well, you need to get every art teacher you can, soak up all the knowledge you can, and develop your own style. So you sort of got a background in painting and and sculpture and ceramics as well? Mm -hmm. And jewelry. And jewelry. Uh -huh. Silversmith. I got, you know, just a little bit, little bit of everything in drawing, so. But I, I, I really liked the 3D when I was in college. I liked the sculpture, liked the pottery, mm -hmm. and, and really enjoyed those two medias, the jewelry and the sculpture and pottery more than anything else. Mm -hmm. When did you sell your first piece of art? I was, uh, I did a, uh, a buffalo uh, in in class, and I was really proud of it. And it had a during the fire, it had a big split in the side. And I remember going home to Bartlesville, and there's a little shop there, and they asked if they could set it in there. And this was, gosh darn, 40 years ago. And uh, a person, I think they were from California, bought my first piece. Was it in a show per se, or? No, it wasn't show. It was just on display. It's just on display. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then, And this was at at college. Yeah, but I wasn't at college at the time. I was home for the summer. Oh, okay. And then they had just. I'm sorry. I just put the uh, display up. Also, uh, the Bartlesville Indian Women's Club. Uh, they helped me out with supplies and scholarship money as well as, you know, all the other things. But, you know, they were a real part of uh, helping me get supplies. 
That's wonderful. So, what was your first art award? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I'd have to say it was in uh, jewelry. Uh huh. But, but you Do know, you remember that, the show? No, don't remember the show. Don't remember, but I remember that I was really into jewelry at at the time, and uh, I know I got an award in in jewelry, but I I couldn't even tell you the piece. Mm -hmm. um, were you conscious of kind of uh, admiring some other jewelers or any particular styles of jewelry that um, sort of? Well, I, I really liked the uh, Navajo style because what you do, you take the, the stone and build your design around the stone. And I enjoyed that more than, I, let's say, uh, the Zuni where they put all the little stones and... Uh, I also enjoyed, oh gosh, my, my brain cells are fried. I, uh, where, where they do their jewelry, but it's more like a picture. On, okay. And I can't even think, my, my, like I said, my, I'll think of it when we're talking. And... <laughs> you can go in the transcript later. We'll edit some of this out, but yeah. Um, so there was never a point at which you thought you might want to do art commercially because you had this love. You knew you wanted to be a teacher as well when you Correct. graduated. Correct. I, I didn't want to go into the commercial end of it. I, I truly enjoyed the fine arts. Where did, where did you get your first teaching job? Uh, here in Tulsa at uh, McLean High School. And I was there for 17 years, I think. And uh, my students won numerous awards throughout the state and set up lots of exhibitions. And then my kids at that time were going to East Central High School and I just wanted to move over there and be closer to them. How did you balance your teaching, your artwork in those early years? It was a lot easier. I had a lot more energy. I mean, I could, you could go, you know, pull an all-nighter and work all night and be ready to go. And then, like now, boy, 10 o'clock comes and that's it. Um, one, one thing I will say, you know, an artist, I call it a zone. When an artist gets in a zone, you don't want, because it doesn't happen that often, but when it hits there, you know, take full advantage of it, and you can just go. <laughs> How many shows were you going to in that early period when you first... Mm -hmm. About the same number as I am now, because um, my high school took up so much of my time. And I, my high school shows, we enter anywhere from 9 to 15 art competitions and exhibitions a year, plus my shows. And uh, I figured when I retire from teaching, I'll, I will travel farther out. And, uh, but as of right now, I still enjoy teaching, so I stay closer to home. And I remember, you know, first seeing your work in terms of jewelry, first seeing jewelry, were you, from the beginning, always painting and sculpting as well, or did that become more important as you got started? Well, no, I always enjoyed sculpture, number one. I enjoy the sculpture more than any other media. Painting, what I would wind up doing is maybe painting one or two pictures a year, and they'd always sell, and, and but I just, wasn't that much into painting till about the last, oh, I don't know, uh, 10 years or so, 12 years. And I said, well, you know, this is really a lot of fun. So, yeah. and my, the style that I develop, uh, I like Joanne Bird's work, and I also like Earl Biss's work, and I was going, well, I can do that. But I mean, have my own style. Right. So I'd say those two people influenced me on the type of my artwork was, you know, due to them. Once you taught your dad how to do some jewelry making and 
you two set up with that one show. Did you continue to show together a little bit? Oh, what, yes, what and also, like? <laughs> also taught my older brother. Okay. I do uh, silversmithing. Is and this Greg or? Greg. Okay. And uh, he became quite an accomplished silversmith as well. So what was that like going to doing shows with your dad? Well, you know, it was really funny because whenever we'd go to a show and, you know, we'd be miles apart and we couldn't <laughs> wait to go to the show to show the other person what we had done. And it was almost the same stuff. I mean, same ideas. Wow. So that was kind of unusual. That's very unusual, sort of thinking along parallel. Like, what, what about stones? What kinds of stones were you working with early on? Er, the first, when I first started, I usually used the uh, mussel shell. And I used a lot of onyx and I used a lot of uh, turquoise. What's the best piece of business advice that you got from another artist or uh, gallery owner at the time? You know, I don't know. I, you know, like I said, that's many years ago. But I would say that, uh, you know, when I go to these shows and stuff, uh, my dad always told me, he said, Clance, always enjoy the show and the people and the surroundings. You're not gonna make a hundred bucks every time you go to a show, but enjoy it. And when you have that kind of attitude, even if you don't sell anything, you come away a winner. Mm. So I've always kind of kept that, that that's, philosophy. That's a great, great one. How would you describe the changes from in the Indian art scene from the 70s to the 80s? I think uh, from going from the 70s to the 80s, there, there was such a surge of, of uh, appreciation of the Native American culture, Native American art, and the Native American artists who produced the work uh, benefited from that because they got to expose their culture and their knowledge, and their sense of being. Were you involved with a couple of galleries here in state? Oh, you know what? Uh, going back to teaching, I just didn't have time. Mm. You know, so that's the reason why I went to shows, because I just didn't have time. Because if I did this full time, I could probably make more money than I do teaching, except that it becomes a job, and then you know, something I have to do. So I keep it as something that it's my release. I enjoy it. I have fun doing it. Do you remember uh, how things kind of changed from the 80s to the 90s? Uh, I think I was more involved in learning. In it myself was learning and watching other artists than I was in the 70s, 80s. From the 80s and 90s, I became more aware of all the different types of Native American artwork. And I tried to gear myself to the Southwest style. And I bet, you know, when I'm, I'm teaching, I gotta teach everything. <laughs> right. So. So you were looking also, for example, at sculpture, you were kind of yeah, I, I, absorbing I, I try to talking uh, with other sculptors. just absorb everything you can. You know, when I take my kids to art shows, my high school kids, I tell them, go talk to the artist. Ask them how they did it. I say, mm -hmm. most of them are going to be really excited that you're talking to them. And uh, then look at the styles, look at the different techniques that they use. And then, then come back and try it out. Usually when I go to a show, or even with my kids in classroom, you know, I teach them a lesson or something, and I, I see one of them do something a little different, and I go, whoa, this is neat, and I'll go back and do it. <laughs> you know, just, and, and whenever you think you know it all, 
that's when you might as well check it in. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's an ongoing learning process. Um, in 1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed requiring artists to show proof of Indian identity or have a you know, letter from the tribe certifying them as an artist who could represent that tribe. Do you remember how that impacted um, individuals and in galleries? I guess you weren't too involved with the gallery scene, but shows. Well, I know that uh, there are a lot of, of uh, artists out there that could not prove that they were Native American, uh, but they looked Native American, and their work was unbelievably great. And so I think, therefore, you know, they uh, took a hit on that. And uh, the way I look at it, competing with other artists, it's when you can go out and compete with those guys. And you know you're at their caliber but it doesn't make any difference who goes you know that, that's my own personal opinion I'm real competitive that way so uh, I feel like uh, I think it hurt but then a way it didn't hurt because then that way you know people who bought the Native American artwork could actually say this is authentic Native American work and I know they have a lot of uh, Native American artisans now you know and I'm glad they, they got that in there so some of them can show. And, you know, um, even uh, cowboy artists, have, you know, you kind of flip-flop back and forth. But, yeah. It, 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 and like I said, it didn't affect me that much, but I know a lot of artists that it did affect. Um, art, art's at least a two-person business a lot of times, and I remember seeing for example, I think your older son at some of the shows and maybe all of your children over the years have helped out. Can you talk about the role your family plays in your work? As far as my artwork? Or maybe it shows, you know, just any aspect of the art business. Well, I, you know, I tell my two boys, they're both very talented and they've both won numerous awards you know, throughout their high school career. Now, Brett, he is branched off and he is doing commission work and he's very talented. Dax, you know, I think Dax can do the work, but he, that's not what he's into right now. And when it's time for them to uh, say, you know, I want to get back in this, <laughs> they will. <laughs> you know, you know, I just don't push them like, you need to do this and you need to do that. You know, you just, you know, that. You know, God's going to tell you when it's time, so that's the way I look at it. Have you, are commissions an important part of your work? Commissions? Uh, you know what? I really don't enjoy the commission work as much as I do when I just go out in my garage and have fun. When I do commission work, uh, that means I'm, uh, I sit there and I just got to do it. You know, and it's not as challenging, not as much fun, but I do it because it uh, brings in the extra money. A uh, good example, a uh, lady ordered a bracelet from me. <laughs> Took me a year to get it done, and after I did it, I liked it, so I went and I did another bracelet in two days. So there, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, I like to do things on my own. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I commission works fine. But I really enjoy just being able to sit there and create and do the things that I want to do. And I've been really fortunate and really blessed that, you know, people buy my artwork. Have you competed for any kind of public artworks? I know generally your sculptures seem are not quite, you know, large scale pieces usually, but have you? Mm, no, because I'm too busy at mm -hmm. school. I mean, school just takes up an unbelievable amount of time. And especially in the, the busy part of our year, I'm usually at school till way before school till way after dark. You know, we, we just keep after it. You, you've talked about some of the things you try to share with your students. What, 
What are some other things that you really want them to get from your art classes? Uh, a really better understanding of, of what art's all about. What uh, art, art's everywhere. It's on cans, it's on billboards, it's in the homes, it's the architect. It's, it's just not a canvas or a piece of clay. I mean, art is everywhere. And if the kids can grasp that and take hold, then uh, they're that much better for it. The um, teaching at McLean and also at, the, at East um, Central to a degree sometimes, um, you've, you've worked quite a bit with um, minority children and lower income children and what have been some of the rewards and challenges of that? Uh, again, probably my best story. I had a mother come up to me and say, uh, I don't know if you remember me, but my daughter went to school and she took a class under you. And I said, I remember. And she said, I want you to know that she is going to graduate from college this, this spring. She's going to get married. And since then, I've gone back, got my GED. I'm now in college and taking classes. Her brothers never finished high school, have gone back and got their GED, and they are taking tech classes. All her cousins, her cousins, are seeing the benefits of what education can do for you and are going back to school. Now that, that to me wraps it up. When, when you know, and it, I don't know how to put it. Uh, you never know how you're going to influence someone down the road. So when I try to live every day to the fullest, I try to be positive all the time. And it's kind of hard sometimes with that many kids in the classroom. But the whole idea is to hopefully you'll make an impact, a positive impact on their life. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Some of the tribes are really working harder these days to get behind their artists and um, whether it's in terms of, of scheduling shows or trying to give them some more visibility or buying pieces from their artists. Um, any thoughts on that situation? Uh, I think that it, it's a really a great idea. I think that um, the more exposure that, that you can give your tribe and your ideas and your art talent and stuff like that, and they help promote you, uh, that's a that's a uh, no lose. I mean, no loss situation. It's it's going to benefit both you and the tribe. And I know that a lot of the shows that I go to, uh, you know, there are so many different tribes and so many really talented artist uh, that it really makes it fun. Friendships are a big part of it, aren't they? Friendships that you develop with other artists. No, that's how, you know, just <laughs> like I told you before, that, you know, when my dad said enjoy the people, enjoy the situation, even if you don't sell, you learn from that. And, and I have grown to where I have several really good friends that are in the Native American art field. Is, has that happened a bit with collectors too, repeat collectors that you... I think on repeat collectors, uh, if you're fortunate to have people who really love your work, uh, you know, they're, it's going to sell itself. You know, they're going to come back and, and, you know, buy more or they're going to tell their friends. So it's kind of like that type of situation. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit more now about um, your techniques a little bit and, and philosophies. Um, starting with your jewelry, uh, you mentioned some of the stones you worked with initially, and I think one of them was shell, right? Uh -huh. um, and there are some challenges to that, aren't there? It's kind of... 
Well, whenever you're cutting your own shell and stuff, it's real toxic. So you, what you want to do is use a lot of ventilation, a lot of water, and uh, that way. And I've made myself kind of sick, you know, a few times where, you know, I didn't have it set up just right. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and. But what stones now are you using mostly? It's still mostly silver that you're working with. Uh, right, I usually just use the sterling silver. I use uh, lots of different types of turquoise. You know, I think uh, the turquoise is the eyes and the beholder. And so I try to get real picky with my turquoise, you know, and then a lot of times I will sit there and think a long time before I decide what to do with it. And the same way with my paintings. I might paint seven or eight backgrounds and I might sit on them for six, eight months before it comes to me what I want to do with it. Now the sculptures, that's a little different. I have an idea in my head pretty much uh, what I want to do, but then the research goes in to make sure everything's in the right perspective and, and it's, you know, I'm going to reach my goal that way. Going back to your jewelry, when you, what kinds of design qualities do you want it to evoke? What, what are you thinking about when you come up with those initial designs? Well, like I said, you know, I take the stone and then I build the, the design around the stone and I want the stone to be the main attraction and I want the other silver work to enhance it. So they have to work together. They, they uh, you, you know, you're not gonna have one without the other. You know, and so therefore they uh, kind of build on each other. But uh, the silver work more of an accent to the stone. And I guess that's the reason why I'm particular on the stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, like your jewelry, what I love about it is it's, it's not quiet jewelry, you know what I mean, but it, it's not super flashy either. It just, it when you put it on, it just wears well. It always hangs right or it, you know, it has this. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I, uh, I just, I don't know, I, you know, I always tell people who look at artwork and if they're interested in buying or whatever, and I said, does it talk to you? So. And if it's talking to you, yeah. then you know that's something you should look into. Right. You know, I mean, uh, paintings, sculptures, jewelry, you know, you know, you can say, oh, that's real pretty. But if it really talks to you, you ought to think about it. That's what I, that's how I uh, tell a lot of people when they're looking at artwork. Just don't buy it because it's there or an investment thing because mm -hmm. It'll probably sit in a box and it'll never be worn or sit in a closet. But what you want to do is you really like the piece, really talks to you, really love it. And then, then that's what makes you happy. That's what makes me happy when my art pieces talk to people. When you buy your stones, is there a particular, um, do you have some favorite stores? Do you order? Um, I had a, a really good friend. His name was Will Doty. He passed away last spring. And I think over 25 years, I bought lots of stones from him. Mm -hmm. Lots of, from Sujulite to Azurite, to Malachi, to Turquoise. Was he located here in Oklahoma? Agates, uh, he was, uh, and his son is a dealer in stones, but I don't know where he's stationed. But I remember going to Will's house and spend hours looking at stones. And then also, uh, out west, my uh, brother, when he was in silversmithing, you know, he would uh, say, well, found some good stones. Okay, you know, <laughs> and so we'd buy them and split them up and, and uh, you know, go from there. Talking about your paintings a little bit, you um, have developed a as you say, you've been influenced by some of these uh, a sort of native impressionistic kind of style, and you like to use a palette knife, I guess, quite palette a bit. Knife. Palette uh, knife. I uh, like to show a lot of movement, uh -huh. lots of colors, and sometimes you really can't even tell what it is. 
you know, but I mean, if uh, everything is moving right, then, then I've accomplished my goal. It's almost like a kind of action painting, isn't it, for you, that if you're really working that palette knife? Uh, it, it just starts flowing. Quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked about the zone earlier. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hit this zone, you know, you don't want to put it down. It just kind of flows. And most of your paintings are on canvas, is that right? Uh, I do I do watercolor as well. I do some pencil, but I enjoy the, the well, I don't know. I just haven't done that many watercolors, but I enjoy the watercolors as well as I do the uh, canvas paintings. In terms of sketching, do you do any sketching, preliminary sketching for your jewelry or your painting? Uh, it depends on the subject matter, you know, like, uh, on, on, let's say on my sculptures, gosh, even as many buffaloes that I've done or horny toads or anything that I've done, I have pictures and books and more pictures and books and bone structures and I've got it all, you know, and the, the best example is to go out and find something that's real, mm. you know, and go from there. Um, in terms of your sculpture, I, I think texture seems to be really important to you there. You, you mainly work in bronzes, is that right? Mm, clay and bronze. Clay and bronze. Uh -huh. Now, on the, the texture that I use, uh, it just really, like again, it just depends on the, on the piece itself, but uh, uh, when I teach my kids at school, I just tell them I don't want uh, something that's real stoic. I want to show movement. I want to be able to tell a story without you telling me what the, the title is. Mm. And then therefore, you've accomplished your goal, whether the viewer sees it or not, you've accomplished your goal. So that's what I try to do with mine. I try to tell a story. And there usually is a story behind each piece. So with the, the clay, are you saying some of the sculpture is, fire, is fired, kind of fired uh -huh, It's fired and then I usually airbrush it. Okay. And then I, I enjoy the raku and I enjoy stoneware. And uh, uh, there's so many things I'd like to do, but there's just not enough time. Have you explored masks at all with the ceramic? Not personally, but mm -hmm. that's infiltrated in my uh, uh, curriculum for my clay kids. Interesting. What was the most challenging piece of sculpture that you did? Well, the most challenging piece that I ever did was it was a, a hand coming up and it had a woman coming up through the hand and it had the buffalo robe and had the shield and I was just about ready to have it all done and it fell and broke. So, I mean, I already hollowed out and everything and I just said, it wasn't meant to be. I'm not even going to attempt it again until I think I'm ready. But that was probably my most challenging piece, but I lost it. But I still remember it, so it's still back in my head. Right. Another try. What is, what size do you typically work in when you're working in sculpture? Or is there a... Uh, no particular... You know, I don't want it real big because there's not that many people that can have big pieces of sculpture, you know, in their home. I try to uh, make more vertical than horizontal because more people have vertical space in their home. Subconsciously, I think of it like that, but most of my pieces are horizontal. Do you have a foundry here in state or? I, I am, take my artwork to the Bronze Horse in Pahuska. Oh, nice. I uh, think that there's two artists involved. That's the person who creates it and the person who duplicates it. 
and I and I have found that they uh, have done my pieces justice, and I just keep going back there. <laughs> How long have they been around? Oh, I the way before I even started artwork, so. We've talked about the fact that your brothers are also gifted artists, and um, I think Sean Shan. Shan is the one that's... Uh, He's doing the American. Right. Have you guys ever sort of swapped ideas or thought about collaborating on a piece? Well, I don't think so much collaborating as I think that we... Uh, uh, I probably ask more questions for Shan, you know, to help me out than he does me. But, I mean, he has asked me questions. And, and he's working uh, at a way bigger scale. <laughs> right. I mean, like, uh, he's done so many, like, the three Miss Americas at Oklahoma City University, Billy Vessels, Maverick mm -hmm. at uh, Warren Spawn, uh, Shannon Miller, Dr. Suji. I mean, he has done some unbelievable sculptures. When you're doing a bronze, um, and bronzes are kind of, the foundry process is kind of expensive. Um, do you do any pre-selling? How do you? I think that once again, it just depends on the piece. Like uh, if I could uh, get my, uh, sell my horny toad and that would give me enough to make a bronze piece out of it you know and i plan to do another horny toad but on a smaller version so i have found several horny toads with different poses that are actually almost vertical and that's that's what my first bronze of a horny toad will be it's not going to be you know flat on the ground like my clay pieces but we actually protruding up, looking up. So these are like photographs that you've mm -hmm. seen? Like, I, like uh, anytime I look in the National Geographics or, you know, any magazines and I see pictures that I like of certain animals. And then most of my wildlife is from North America. Usually North American wildlife. I, I go with it like that. And I think horn toads are just, um, especially now when they're sort of disappearing you don't find them as readily as you used to no it's us. been it's been a long time since I've seen a horny toad out in the wild mm -hmm. I think the last time I saw one was uh, my kids were still in school and I was coming home from McLean High School saw one run across the highway out by the airport stopped my vehicle waited for the cars to pass went out and caught it brought it home so they could see it because they've never seen one and then we went out to uh, Coweta and uh, found her out at my aunt's place and found a red ant hill and turned it loose there so I figured <laughs> it had a better shot there than than the airport right right what is your creative process from the time that you get an idea just kind of walk us through it. Well, like I said, most of the time I, I want to definitely tell a story without looking at the title. I want to show movement. And so for I, I take those in consideration when I start forming my piece. And uh, I, like I said, I don't want it to be standing still. I want it to, even if it's laying down and stuff, I can still show movement. How, how, how can you show movement if it's just laying down? Oh, like uh, instead of just, let's say, uh, uh, I, I'm wanting to do a sculpture of a baby uh, buffalo. And instead of having both legs underneath him, and the ones underneath him in the back, I can have him kind of sprawled out and his head laying down kind of across one arm, mm -hmm. and there's your movement. Mm -hmm. In terms of patinas, what are your, some of your favorites? Uh, I don't really know the name of them, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, John and Matt helped me 
I tell them what I want, and they usually get the patinas. At the, and at the bronze horse, they usually get the patinas that, like I like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if I tell them I want more red in it, they get more red. If I want more uh, copper in it, they get more copper. If, you know, it's just a, a whole neat process the way that they do it. Mm -hmm. How do you handle your signature? Because sometimes that's kind of an art, art decision in itself. It's pretty simple. Okay. The it's more simple, the better. <laughs> it's just four little letters and that's it. <laughs> How important is humor in your work? Uh, I think that uh, I'll just take example of uh, my buffalo that's sitting there and he's so fat, he's trying to turn around and scratch his head, and I call it too <laughs> fat to scratch. So, you know, it plays a part, but everything's got to fall into place for it to work. And so do your titles come pretty readily most of the time after the piece is finished, or? A lot of times depend? they come before I even start the piece. And a lot of times it's, I'm done with the piece and then it comes to me, you know, what I'm trying to uh, present. And that's with the paintings as well. Do you keep track of your ideas in a notebook at all or? Nope. I just, uh, like I said, I, I do this because I enjoy it. And I guess when I quit teaching, uh, it'll have to be where I have to keep more of a notebook, you know, but no, I don't. <laughs> so what is your creative routine? Do you try to get a certain amount of hours in per day or on the weekends? Uh, as far as my jewelry work, I might cut stones, you know, 20, 30 stones, and then I'll sit on them. And then when it hits me, then I'll work. Artwork? Uh, my paintings, same thing. Oh, excuse me. I might uh, paint the backgrounds and then sit on those for a long time before I feel like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Sculptures, um, a lot of times I know that I, I worked on an eye for two or three hours and then just sit. <laughs> And then take it off and start over. Mm. So, you know, I whenever I hit that zone, I want to take advantage of it. <laughs> right. So what's been one of the most important art awards you've won up to this point? Mm. That's a tough question because I think any time that you win an art award, whether it's a big show, little show, it, it's a precious moment because you you have shown what what you're capable, your ideas, your whether like I said, whether it's a big show, little show, and if people recognize your artwork for as being good, then so be it. What? Looking back on your career so far, what has been kind of a fork in the road moment when you might have taken one path, but you decided to go this other way? Well, probably the best example would have been, uh, uh, you know, when I was playing baseball, I thought I was going to be a baseball player. And I uh, uh, chose art instead, best thing I ever did. What's been one of the high points of your career? Probably, I get a lot of those. I mean, anytime I go to a show, anybody that sees my work and just goes, wow, look at this. I mean, some stand out a little bit more than others, like uh, uh, an example, I was telling the lady about The Last Emperor, it's my buffalo that's going down, and I told her that, uh, that it's got shot going down, but it still looks pretty majestic as it's going down and, and I turned around, she had tears coming out of her eyes. So, you know, anytime, anything like that, any any people who just take the time to want to know about the artist, know about their work and 
what made you do this? And so it's always fun. What's been one of the low points? I haven't had any real low points. You know, I, like I said, uh, I enjoy it. I, I can live and breathe it and eat it every day. And I do not really have a low point. You know, speaking of your buffalo, and um, I'm just wondering if you've been to the, do you go to the tall grass preserve sometimes and take pictures? Tall, tall grass prairie preserve? No, I have not been able to go yet. I need to go, but I, like I said, you know, teaching, then go to the shows, and then there's just not enough hours in the day. I mean, you'd think I'd take off. In fact, when I quit coaching, I said, gosh, this is going to be great. I'm going to get to go to more shows, do more things. I'm more busy now than I was, you know, when I was coaching. And I wonder how I even accomplished what I did when I did, but... I really enjoy the kids at school and whenever they're working, producing, and enjoying it and, and uh, winning awards, it's pretty exciting. So what's either a personal project or a project you're, you've embarked on with your students that you're particularly excited about right now? Well, in my advanced uh, AP class, we uh, started doing more sketching. And uh, besides them working on their breath and concentration, we are doing more sketching. And I found, I think that kind of energizes their base. Uh, but they should have been doing the sketching all along. But this way it's required. So now, uh, you know, they have to do it. And uh, a lot of them just do it on their own anyway. A lot of my kids work probably on four and five projects at a time. So, which is really great. That way there's no slack time. Then on my uh, form design class, which is my sculpture class, which is my favorite class. <laughs> uh, you know, they're trying to finish up their big projects for the fall now. So by the middle of next month, they should be pretty well done and getting ready to go to shows and compete. And then, of course, my Art One kids, uh, they become a real challenge. You, you know, they're at this level, and I want them at this level. And I want them <laughs> up here to be able to compete with the Booker T's and the Jinx and Edmund Norris and Norman High School. I want them to be able to compete with you know, the Holland Halls and Sky Took and all these schools that are really up and coming in the fine arts. Did you introduce any programming, art programming, that they haven't had previously at Central? East Central? Mm -hmm. we're, we're probably, uh, I'm gonna say, we're one of very few high schools that does raccoon firings. We are the only high school I know of that does that, that get to do pewter castings. We're one of a handful of schools that gets that get to do uh, jewelry. And I'm hoping within the next year or two before I retire that it, we implement stone cutting. And so that would be my big project is stone cutting and uh, have the facilities and the tools and all that to, to pursue it. You've got some lucky students. Is there anything we've forgotten or that you'd like to add before we look at your artwork? Uh, I think we pretty well covered it. <laughs> all right, well, we're gonna get ready to take a look at some pieces. And we're looking at one of your buffaloes. Uh, this is called Too Fat to Scratch. <laughs> and uh, we, we talked about the humor part of it uh, before and what how I got this idea when I was a young boy on my grandfather's farm and I had this big old black Angus bull uh, in the barn and I was watching him. He was sitting there trying to scratch his head and behind his ear and he couldn't reach it. <laughs> so I said I, I would always love to do a, a piece like that. That is great. How many in this... 
series? Uh, the series of nine and with the artist proof. Mm -hmm. And I'm down to, this is number seven, I have three left. Wow. And uh, uh, the artist proof goes to my kids. Oh, that's really neat. We're looking at a couple of pieces of your, of your jewelry now. And uh, I enjoy the turtle. It's a, in our culture, the turtle's a sign of good luck. So I happen to call this piece good luck. And uh, it's more uh, surrealistic. It's not a real sculpture of a turtle, but you can tell it's a turtle. And then my bolo here, I call it tranquility. And it just has a, a, a soothing effect. Mm -hmm. I feel like it does. It, get, it gives off that kind of vibe. What are the different stones that uh, are different turquoise from different places? I know uh -huh. the turquoise. Uh, the, the one on the on the right is Tranquility. It's a China Mountain turquoise, and the one on well, in fact, both of them are China Mountain turquoise. Mm. And uh, what happened was when That's they tried to green. break into the market. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you guys want want me to say anything about that or not. But but what well, what the deal was? Okay, you... what the deal was when they broke into the market, they were selling their good stones for 300, 350 a pound. Mm -hmm. And see the good stuff from the like the Kingman mine, mm -hmm. Sleeping Beauty mine. Uh, Fox my all these they were selling theirs for 800 mm -hmm. to a thousand a pound yeah. so I bought all I could because I knew it was good stuff. right right it's just gorgeous the colors um, and you give titles to your jewelry as well huh only the, only the big pieces okay okay I couldn't do it to all mine right uh, this particular painting I wanted uh, to put that as early morning mist Mm -hmm. And uh, the the war ponies they they're all excited because they know they're going to go on a hunt, you know, and, they, and they're really pumped up. So that's what I wanted to show on this piece. You can you can see the hill in the background and the texture, the relief on the paint. Yeah, that's really nice. Now uh, this painting's called the Three Wise Men, and uh, basically they're the 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 tribe's elders. And they have all the wisdom, and and uh, you know that that's who they go to when they have problems and stuff like that. Lots of nice movement, again, lots of texture. That's great. Well, I thank you very much for your time today, Clancy. Well, thank you.